Church, we are continuing in our study today, uh, Rooted, which is a study of the book of Colossians. What a powerful uh, letter this is to the church there in Colossae, and it's the very words that they needed so they could continue in Christ. And Paul here, today we're going to see, he makes a statement uh, that they needed to understand that he was committed to root them in the word of God. And so today the title of the message is Rooted in the Word. If you will look in verse 25, the second part, you will see that he states to them uh, to present to you the word of God in its fullness. This is one thing that Paul was committed to. He wanted to know, he wanted them to know the fullness of the word of God, not a part of it, not just a consideration of it, but the fullness of of it. Now, if you were to go to your doctor and uh, you went for a physical exam and the doctor examined you, would you want the doctor to tell you what you wanted to hear or what you needed to hear? Uh, we may say, well, just give me a glowing report no matter what it is. Tell me my blood pressure is perfect. Uh, uh, tell me my weight's perfect. Tell me everything is perfect. Or would you rather know the truth of the matter? Uh, give me the real blood work, the real blood pressure, and, and the real facts about my weight. Uh, it, it is best to get the truth. And this is what Paul knew, is they had to have the fullness of the Word of God, the full message, the full understanding, in order to be rooted in the Word correctly. And so today we are going to see four keys to Paul's ministry, and obviously this is one of them, is that he was going to present the fullness of the Word of God. The four keys to Paul's ministry effectiveness is going to help us um, learn how to minister effectively to other people. Uh, do you know anyone in your life currently, if you just stop and think, do you know someone who used to be faithful to the Lord, uh, but they're kind of floundering, they're, they've gone astray, we have a number of terms that we use for that, but they're not where they used to be. That is, in love with the Lord, serving the Lord, faithful to the Lord in every area, looking for ways to proclaim the gospel, looking for ways to disciple people, having people into their home and investing in them, connecting with people in the church the way that they used to. But for some reason, they have pulled back. For some reason, they have gone a different direction. Now, they're still saved. They still know the Lord. Uh, but something has happened in their life. See, this is what Paul was dealing with with the believers at Colossae. He had been notified that they were beginning to slip away, that there were uh, false prophets among them, leading them to believe that Jesus was one of many ways, something to consider, yes, uh, something of validity, but not the thing. And so he had to bring them back around. He had to call them back to faithfulness, call them back to full commitment and surrender to Jesus Christ. And so we see how he does this. And so we can learn from him. And, and you know, don't we learn from other people? And we should. And we can learn from Paul today how to have an effective ministry. You may be struggling in your ministry today. You just don't have the passion you used to have. You're just not as surrendered as you once were. You're not sure what the next step is. You know you believe in Jesus. You know he's your Savior. But you've lost that heart that drive, that passion, that excitement. I want you to learn from Paul today how to regain that by studying these four keys to Paul's ministry. Beautiful stuff. We need it. And so I want to share these four keys with you beginning in verse 24. The first, and maybe foundationally one of the most significant of the four we're going to look at because it determined Paul's availability and his um, credibility with the believers to say the things he was going to say. And this is number one, Paul rejoiced in suffering. Let me read the verse to you. It says, Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regards to Christ's afflictions. For the sake of his body, which is the church. There's a lot bound up in this verse. Now, I want to read the first part to you in the NASB. 
um, because it states it this way. Now, I rejoice in my suffering for your sake. In the NIV, it says, now I rejoice in what was suffered for you. But I want you to understand that what Paul is referring to is the suffering he has gone through, the suffering he's currently going through for the sake of the believers, for the sake of the church. Paul had something that many believers never capture in their life, and it's this, a handle on suffering. Oftentimes when suffering comes to the believer, they are challenged. You really believe what you say you believe. Are you going to have the faith to trust the Lord through the suffering? Let's see if you really believe the things you say you believe now that God is taking you through the things that you're going through. And suffering has a way of testing our faith. Suffering has a way of determining if we are truly going to depend on God no matter the circumstances. But too often, suffering can cause believers to desert the church and to disconnect. It could be because of personal loss, loss of a mate, loss of a child, whatever the loss may be, loss of your health. It could be because of rejection. Someone's come along and rejected you, and the Lord allowed that, and it's a very hurtful rejection. Maybe your mate uh, left you for someone else. Maybe... Um, you have been rejected by a friend who no longer wants to be your friend. I don't know what the rejection may be, but God's allowed it. And in it, you can't understand why God's allowed it, why he's brought such suffering to you. It could be that you have a loss of direction in your life. I don't know what the cause may be, but whatever it is, you can put it in the category of suffering, something God's allowed in your life that is not pleasant for you. It brings emotional pain. It could be physical pain. It could be a lot of different things. But God, in His providence, allows it, and then we get to embrace it and trust God with it. And a lot of people, when that happens, they desert and disconnect from the church and from God's purposes for them. But not so with Paul. Paul learned that suffering has purpose. Suffering is not, write this down, meaningless. All suffering has purpose. He knew the purpose. He had embraced the purpose. He had connected with the purpose of his suffering. And it took on meaning. And when suffering takes on meaning, it energizes us with a resolve to continue to trust in Jesus. Now, when this happens, the world's watching. When this happens, people around you are watching. Uh, other believers are watching. And, and they take to heart your faith in trusting God. Wasn't this true for Daniel in the Old Testament? Wasn't it true for those who were his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that in intense suffering, circumstances out of their control, where they could lose their life, lion's den, um, to, to go into the fiery furnace, those two things alone, that people were watching, have you ever considered that God puts us in impossible situations so that our life will be a testimony to other people? Did you know that Paul's life right here in prison is being a testimony to other people in the midst of his suffering? And when he embraced that God, he believed in his heart that God said the suffering had purpose, that it had meaning, and he was going to trust God with it. It gave him a new resolve to press on and to trust the Lord. Take for example, a very simple illustration. Say you're on a basketball team and your coach comes to you and says, listen, we're going to work hard this year and we're going to experience pain and suffering in practice. You say, well, I don't really want to do that. Let's just kind of practice and have a good time and I'll go home. But the coach convinces you that the pain and the suffering, the extra running, the extra practice, the extra weightlifting, the extra instruction, all that will come is going to win you a national championship. All of a sudden, when you run that extra lap and you have side stitches and you're on the line to run another suicide and you just can't breathe, you run it anyway because there's purpose in the suffering because you're telling yourself, I am going to embrace this pain, this suffering because I want to win a national championship. And the whole time you're doing it, the coach is over there telling you, we're going to win a national championship. Press on. Go, go another lap. Put all out today in practice, and it'll pay off in the game, right? 
And so there's, I am just telling you that illustration because, and then you push a little harder and you go a little more because you're connecting purpose to the pain. Oftentimes as believers, when the pain comes and the rejection is felt and you can't see the vision to go forward, you lose hope in the purposes that God has for you. But what Paul learned was this, God is still in control. What he learned was this, is I can trust God fully, no matter. And in so doing, he connected his faith to the purposes of God, which gave him a resolve in the midst of it to go forward. You say, how do you know? How do you know he really did this? That he found purpose in his suffering. I want to give you four evidences that that is the truth. And here they are. Number one, you, you see this in his attitude of rejoicing. That's the first thing we see. Look at verse 24. He says, now I, what? Rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. Hmm. We got to stop and think about this for a second. Paul's saying, I rejoice in what I'm suffering for your sake. Now, how many people do you know that actually would say that? Actually would live through it. That they would suffer for your sake. Maybe your parent, uh, maybe a mate, somebody that would go through something, a parent for a child, right? But someone you don't even know, someone in the body of Christ that they had never met, but yet Paul is saying to them, I am rejoicing in my suffering. To rejoice in suffering is a sign of spiritual maturity. It, it, it says that you've learned to truly trust God with all things, even suffering. Acts 5.41 says this, the apostles left the Sanhedrin, watch this, rejoicing because they have been counted worthy of the suffering and disgrace for the name. There was this connection, this thought, this understanding biblically that if I suffer for the name of Jesus, I am blessed. And if I am blessed because I'm connected with Jesus, and if he suffered and I will suffer, the Bible teaches, then I, this is a great thing. We don't teach this in America. We, we say get as far away from suffering as you possibly can. But what the Bible teaches is this. If God allows it, it's connected to the glory and the purposes of Jesus in your life and in other people's life, you and I are to say, man, I am so happy about this. What? Have you lost your mind, Mark? No. The Bible says we've got to learn to rejoice. I've struggled with it when I felt the rejection, when I felt the pain, when I felt the pressure of whatever that God's allowed in my life that I wish I didn't go through. And where I've often turned, and I'll encourage you to do the same, is to James 1, verses 2 through 4. And here it says, in the same words, it says, consider it, here it is again, you ready? Pure joy. My brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance, perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And so what I've had to come to grips with is that when things come into my life that are out of my control that I have to trust the Lord with is that God is just maturing me. God's calling me to persevere because my faith is not finalized yet. It's still growing. It's still trusting God. And this is so important. And when I can embrace that and say, okay, yes, I believe that. I'm not a mature Christian. I'm not fully developed as God wants me to be. He's got something else for me. And in, in so doing, I'm going to trust him and watch him do what he can only do. And by faith, I'm going to do that. It allows me to come to a point to embrace it so that I can count it as joy because I'm trusting him. And, and it's powerful. And, and, and the reason I'm telling you this is he is Paul setting up uh, the foundation of credibility with the believers so they will listen to everything he has to say. So you see his attitude of rejoicing. Secondly, you see his focus was on others. Paul was focused on other believers, specifically the Gentiles. He was the chosen apostle to minister to the Gentiles. Ephesians 3, 1 through 13 states this. We know this in his calling on the Damascus Road as well. And now what's key about this is, is simply this. He didn't make the suffering about himself. 
Oh, what kind of sick person are you when you get sick? Some people just literally fall apart. Oh, I'm dying. Go get me this. Do this. Do that, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. If you're sick, you need help. Um, I can be that way sometimes. Or sometimes I just go and I just want to be alone. Now, Michelle's more be alone kind of person. She gets really sick. She just goes and, and she's alone. She doesn't really make it about herself. So that's physical sickness. But what about spiritual uh, suffering that we go through? Do we make it about ourselves? Oh, everything that I'm going through, please pray for me. I, I, and I'm not saying we don't need to pray for one another. We do. But sometimes when God takes us through things, we turn it around and we make it about ourselves than we do about what God's doing and what we're trusting God to do. Paul, he said, listen, this suffering's about you. And I'm good with that. In fact, I'm rejoicing with that. This is not about me. This is why you don't hear Paul say, look, man, I'm over here suffering in prison. Man, the food's terrible over here. Man, you won't believe the accommodations. They don't give me what I want, you know? I, I mean, the, I, I'm the Apostle Paul here. Look at everything I've done and what I should be having at this point in time in my life. Paul didn't do any of that. Paul simply says, man, I'm in jail. I'm going to seize the opportunity. He was witnessing to guards. He was writing letters to churches. He had a perspective of joy for his, for his suffering. And it wasn't about him. It was for other people's advancement in their walk with the Lord. Now that's powerful. His attitude of rejoicing. His focus on others. And then his willingness to suffer for Christ. Let me share a couple of verses with you. In Philippians 3.10, didn't Paul write, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death? Did he not write that? He did. He understood that there was something just beyond the normal life when you suffer and understand what this is all about. We don't teach suffering we teach whatever's best for us we teach escape suffering the bible says embrace suffering in acts 9 15 and 16 it says this this is where he had his damascus road experience right this is where his life was transformed right and he says but the lord said to ananias who would go to paul and he said, go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. Watch this. This was from the beginning, part of his commission and in his call. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Jesus called him to suffer? Yeah, he did. The Bible's very clear he calls us to suffer. I don't know why we're so shocked when we go through things that are suffering. That can be defined as suffering. But he does. So you see his willingness to suffer, listen, for Christ. Fourthly, the fourth evidence I see here is his love for the church. Paul understood what made up the church and why the church mattered. He knew it was made up of believers and that they belonged to Jesus Christ, the one he was willing to suffer for. See, Paul once persecuted the church. Now he's serving and suffering for the church. He wasn't looking to see what the church was going to do for him, but he wanted to do for the church. Isn't that different than today's culture? Even in prison, it, this didn't deter Paul from serving the church. This is the kind of attitude I want to have. This is the kind of attitude I want believers to have. That we're willing to trust for, for the Lord's glory that the church advances as it should. But suffering for Christ in our American culture is hard to grasp. We don't really get it. Matthew 5, 10 through 12 says, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice, there it is again, and be glad. What? That person's cursing me. That person is speaking against me. That person's gossiping against me. That person um, is, is trying to make me fail when I'm trying to serve the Lord. Well, rejoice. You must be doing something right. Because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets 
who were before you. 1 Peter 4, 12 through 16, this verse, these verses have helped me. He said, dear friend, do not be surprised at the painful trials you're suffering as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you're blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed. But praise God, praise God that you bear his name. Do you get that? Do you embrace that? I was reading an article recently in Popular Mechanics. And I didn't know this, and it was interesting to me to learn this, but um, when our military, our Navy, builds a new warship or submarine or any kind of amphibious um, you know, tool for war, there's something they take that uh, vessel through, and it is a testing to determine its strengths and its weaknesses. Um, they take it through uh, a process called mass which is the Navy's maneuvering and sea-keeping basin. This is a place up in Maryland, one of the largest swimming pools in the world. And it's in this swimming pool that they can uh, recreate the elements of the ocean, its waves and its tossing of a vessel back and forth and all that they can do with computers and uh, uh, generators and uh, the com you know, all that they can do to create these waves. I don't know how they do it. They do it somehow, but it's amazing. This particular pool holds 12 million gallons, 240 feet wide, 360 feet long pool to test um, all of their vessels to make sure they are seaworthy. They said of this particular pool mass, it can mimic virtually any sea condition around the world's oceans. And so they take these vessels and they put them in there and they test them to make sure they're seaworthy before they go out to sea. Now, every sailor in the Navy ought to be glad for that before they get on one of those um, vessels, right? But I was thinking about that article. It's fascinating to me that they do that and have the ability to do that. I wonder if we could create some type of recreation of suffering we can put all Christians through before we put them out in the world. What do you think? We can say, hey, guess what? Uh, you just came to know Christ. Now we're going to teach you about the sufferings of Christ that you're going to experience. And we need you to come into this lab and go through all of this suffering so you can understand that when this happens to you, you're supposed to rejoice in the Lord. What do you think? Ah, the Lord doesn't let it happen like that. But you know what? We ought to teach it. We ought to tell our kids that if you stand for Christ, you will be persecuted. If you stand for for the Lord and you have righteousness, people are going to reject you. We should teach our children and we should embrace it ourselves that God in his perfect, perfect will, he is going to put you in situations where the pressure comes that you can't handle it, that you've got to look to him. And when you look to him and you have faith in him, he moves in a way and does things that brings glory to his name as you bear fruit and testify to the world that you're totally trusting him. And that's not going to physically or emotionally feel good. Right? When you're in prison, can you sing? And others watch? We know that story in Scripture, right? Right? When you're in the lion's den, can you be at peace? When you're thrown into the fiery furnace? Oh, those are just, those are just stories in the Bible. Man, those are great stories for kids' worship. Let me ask you a question. Do they really happen? Do you believe those things to be true? I do. I believe that God allows, and, and some people would disagree with me, that if it's a loving God, how can he allow you to go through things like that? You know, that's one of the big hang-ups people have about giving their life to God through Jesus is that a loving God wouldn't allow those kind of things. 
but yet we find it in Scripture. The testimony's there. He will put us through things. And as, as adults, as we model, listen, as we model, it's going to train our children. I remember watching my dad go through some things. I remember, listen, I remember him coming home, having gone through some things. I won't go into the details of all that. I remember in my immaturity going to my room down in the basement and just being angry. How can that be? How can somebody treat my dad that way? da 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 da, da. And I was upset. I had a weight bench over there, and I'd just get over there and just lift weights, get mad, you know, like that's accomplishing anything. But I remember that. But as I watched as a child, I watched my dad in his humility, in his prayer, in his dependence upon the Word, trust God, and God began, <laughs> it's miraculous, God began to move. Uh, people got involved in ways that, um, that, simply came back to this my dad's character was affirmed it was brought to light elevated promoted engaged in such a way that the only only explanation is God allowed it for his development and for God's glory in it all and I don't even know how to explain it to you but I know that he trusted God through that he may have never known, but it was a testimony to me, his son. And it taught me how to trust God through things that are out of our control. That's what we need to teach. That's what we need to live. That's what we need to learn from Paul. It's how to rejoice in suffering. Yes, serving Jesus, we're going to face difficult things. But it's a, I know this is hard to grasp, but it's a privilege to suffer for Christ. We're in a spiritual battle. We're going to face suffering. There's going to be this consternation, this battle that is taking place. We are called to stand and defend the faith. We are called uh, to call people out of a lifestyle of sin. And I'm here to tell you, the enemy's not going to sit back and say, okay, well, you can just have that one. And okay, not a big deal. Um, I'll take this one over here and you take those five over there. And not. No, it doesn't work like that. There is a spiritual battle. We put on the armor of God. We're engaged in spiritual warfare. And in the midst of that, we do, as Jesus did, face suffering. But our God is faithful. That's what Paul knew. I know I've spent a lot of time on this first point. But let me tell you something. Stop and think about it. Paul rejoiced in suffering. That's powerful. Secondly, Paul embraced his commission, verse 25a. He said, I have become a, its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. Now, God commissioned Paul. He never got over this. This was on the Damascus Road, his calling, his commissioning. It transformed him. It formed him to be the man of God that he was. He went from being a persecutor of the church to a proclaimer of the gospel. He's now one willing to serve and suffer for the very church he was persecuting. What a turnaround. Paul understood his commission. He was called to go to the Gentiles. He was called to be a servant. He said, I am a servant. And I wonder, I just wonder if we've lost that in our culture and in our church today. Leaders, people that are in the position that I'm in, I must remind myself constantly, Mark, you are called to be a servant. I'm not called to be a leader that's a figurehead. I'm not called to be a leader that's a celebrity. I'm not called to be a leader that's a CEO. I am called to be a servant like Jesus Christ, like Paul said that he was. Jesus made this clear when he washed the disciples' feet. John 13, 1 through 17, go and read it. You should pray for me to be a servant. Jesus put the towel around. He knelt down. He got the basin of water. He washed their feet, and then he told them, you do likewise. And no one, no servant is above his master. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's evident. But have we lost that in our culture? And if we're not leading that way, how can we call God's people to live that way as well? We must serve as Jesus serves. What Paul knew was the church belongs to Jesus. I've heard pastors, to my heart, Paul, refer to the church where they were serving, the local body of Christ, as their church. No person has a right to be the person that says, this is my 
church. It's not. It's Jesus' church. I didn't die for the church. Jesus did. He was the perfect sacrifice. Jesus is the groom. He's the head of the church. No one else. But what you must understand is that Paul is saying these things up against the false prophets who were setting themselves up as the authorities, the, the Gnosticism, that they had this special knowledge that they knew best, but they didn't know best. Jesus Christ was where it was and where they needed to be reminded of what changed their lives. We live in a culture. You say, how does this apply to me? We live in a culture. Listen to me. We live in a culture. Go turn your computer on. Get on YouTube. Watch some sermons. Watch some ministries. And I, I don't want to be the judge of ministries, but we are to read the fruit and, and, and the motive behind why people do what they do. And oftentimes because of the pragmatism, meaning they'll do whatever it takes to be successful, that's what that word means, they draw crowds and they have excitement. But the question is this, does it bear fruit? in people's lives? Does it draw people into a relationship with Jesus Christ? The Bible's very clear, very clear. In the end times, people will gather around them ministers who will tickle their ears in order to ease their conscience. We must remind ourselves, not everyone is true to the gospel. Some ministers, even as it was in Jesus' day and time, they pursue prestige, influence, money, the lust for the praise of others. Their motivation is to serve themselves, not God. And what Paul was trying to say is, these men that are coming in here, teaching the things they're teaching, they're about themselves, not Christ, but not me. I'm here as a servant. I'm a servant. In fact, in fact I'm willing to suffer for your sake. And I promise you, those guys weren't going to suffer anything, right? Those false prophets. John the Baptist had it right in John 3, 27 through 30, when he replied, a man can receive only what is given him from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said I am not the Christ, but am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and is now complete. Here it is where he got it right. He said he must become greater. I must become less. Paul, the same, saw himself where he knew he was, under Christ, called by Christ, commissioned by Christ as a servant, willing to suffer, rejoicing in that suffering. And on that basis, he reaches to them and says, listen, I am a servant commissioned to serve you. Now that's different than those who were there preaching an alternate gospel. The third thing I want you to see is this, is that Paul presented the word fully. This is very important. This is what we're talking about today, being rooted in the word, that is in the full word. He said, I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is, underline this, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's it. We proclaim him, meaning Christ, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that, that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. The word of God, there it is, in its fullness. Mystery here, the mystery that was revealed, it, it simply means it's something that was once concealed and is now revealed. And that's what it means. But the heretics, their notion was that a mystery was a secret teaching known only to an exclusive group. And so when Paul uses this word mystery to help them understand, in the Old Testament, we have an understanding of what was coming. In fact, the prophets looked into it. They understood parts of it, but not fully. But it's now been fully revealed in Christ. You say, explain the mystery to me. Here it is. God called the nation of Israel to be his people. It's very clear in the Old Testament. He gave them his law, uh, including the priesthood and sacrifices. Then he gave them a land, the promised land. He promised them a king who would one day establish a glorious kingdom and fulfill the many promises made to Abraham and David. Yes, the Old Testament prophets wrote about a Messiah who would suffer and a Messiah who would reign. But where 
they were conflicted and they had a hard time understanding this was that the Messiah first had to suffer but and then he would enter glory and they struggled with this but Christ came he came to the earth he was born of a virgin right um, our Savior with us Christ with us he would he he grew he walked on the earth he ministered he was rejected by people he was crucified he rose again and returned to heaven and the mystery is that today God is uniting Jews and Gentiles in the church. Read Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22 to see this picture. When the church is complete, Jesus Christ will return and he'll take his people to heaven. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. Then he will establish Israel as a nation in the promised kingdom, Acts 15. And that's the Lord's plan. And he came and Christ was the fulfillment of of all of that and what is yet still to come and it was everything I, I mean it was beautiful it was powerful and this is why he said we proclaim him meaning Christ and this proclamation was an announcement with authority which was a contrast to these false prophets who were proclaiming a system of philosophy higher knowledge rules regulations he was proclaiming Christ he said the proclamation, ab admonishing and the teaching that he was commissioned to do for them was for this purpose. Here it is. He desired to present everyone perfect in Christ. You know what you should pray for me? That that would be my heart every day, every second of every day. Every time I'm working on a message, every time I'm counseling with someone, every time I pray with you, every time I do anything, is that my heart, my motive of my heart will be the same as Paul, to present you perfect in Christ. Yes. That's what it's about. That word means mature. To present everyone perfect. Mature is what it means. Complete. Mature in Christ. What a worthy motive. I see these young people sitting here. I long for y'all to be mature in Christ. That's not going to happen because of one sermon. It's not going to happen because you go to student ministry um, every Wednesday night. It's going to take a rooting in this word, in this word, to understand who Christ is. And if that can happen for you, you can go out in the world and you can be confident in Christ, the Holy Spirit being in control of your life, and you walk in obedience to him, can you imagine the joy that would bring to me, to your parents, for God's glory, that you, if, if, when Christ returned, you could be presented perfect in Christ? Man, that's what was driving him. In fact, he said, fourthly, that Paul labored and he struggled, verse 29. He said, to this end I labor, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. This was the end all for Paul. Paul didn't want to build a synagogue that was bigger than the neighbor's synagogue. Paul didn't want to uh, build his reputation bigger than somebody else's reputation. All he wanted was for the believers to be perfect in Christ. And that's what he was laboring for. That was the end all for Paul. The hope of glory to present everyone perfect in Christ. Now, this word labor here means wearisome toil and I think this is a reminder I need maybe you need this as well that this kind of work maybe every teacher that's here today you need this encouragement to keep teaching that this is a work that calls for great labor and it's going to make you tired it's going to exhaust you spiritually and physically it is of great labor you say well how do I keep it up how do I keep going as a parent how do I keep discipling how do I keep instructing how do I keep keeping my child on the straight and narrow how do I do it this is so this is just wearing me out teachers that say how do I keep going week to week and no one's listening how do I keep calling and loving people and discipling them how do you do it Paul said here's how I do it I do it by the power that comes from Christ that's how that's how he was depending on God to give him the strength to do it. It's beautiful. Mm. Struggling. That word struggling, you got the word labor, and then you got the word struggling. That means to agonize like an athlete in an arena. 
It's where we get the English word agony from, uh, from the Greek word. It, it means it's agony. Oh, I thought it was supposed to be joyful. Well, it is, but it's tiresome, and there's just agony involved. Yes. And that's, you know, in, in some ways that's an encouragement to me because it takes a lot of energy, and it takes a lot of time and spiritual struggle to do what I do every week spiritually. But I'm encouraged, okay, yeah, okay, Paul labored. Paul struggled, but he did it with the strength God provided. And that's what I need to do and you need to do to carry on in this work. So how are we doing in these four areas? Let's take a quick test. Question number one, are we suffering joyfully for the gospel? If we're not doing that, we're really out of the game in essence, right? Because if there, in joy, if he wasn't suffering in joy in prison, he would have never penned the letter. He would have been like writing somebody, writing a letter to Caesar, get me out of here, right? Hey, somebody come over here. And I need a better meal than what they're giving me. I mean, it would have been about him. Where are you in your suffering of where God's placed you? Are you doing it for Christ's glory? Question number two, are you serving according to your calling? Am I serving according to my calling? Are you serving according to your calling? You've got to know what the calling is and be obedient to what God's called you to. Thirdly, are you moving people to maturity? Are you just making it through life? Or are you bringing other people along with you to maturity? If you're maturing, well, like I said in James 1, 2 through 4, I, I'm maturing, then I have a responsibility to move other people with me in that maturity. That's called discipleship. Are you bringing other people along or are you dragging people down? It's a great question. We should be admonishing one another, encouraging one another, developing one another. Fourthly, are we working wholeheartedly with his energy? Man, you know, burnout's a, it's a real thing. It's a real thing in our culture. We're very busy. People are running here. They're running there. They only have so much time. They only have so much energy. They only have so much health. And they have to balance everything. And we don't have, and, and, I, and I'm going to tell you the truth. I, what I see for a lot of people is what is last on the list of priority is, is God is tacked on at the end instead of the beginning. But if he'll be the beginning, he'll be your strength. He'll give you balance in the rest. You say, okay, was this really real for Paul? I'm going to tell you it was as a little thing that was written about the greatest man in history, and here's what it says. The greatest man in history was and is Jesus Christ. He had no servants, yet they called him master. He had no degree, yet they called him teacher. He had no medicines, yet they called him healer. He had no army, yet kings feared him. He won no military battles, yet he conquered the world. He committed no crime, yet they crucified him. He died and was buried in a borrowed tomb, yet he lives today. Yes, Jesus, the God-man, the greatest man ever, God-man, Jesus Christ, Savior of the world that walked this earth, those things are true. And here's the reason I read that to you is, I am convinced Paul's ability to deal with suffering and be joyful, Paul's willingness to, to suffer for others. Paul's willingness to disciple others. Paul's willingness to do all the things we're looking at here to struggle and labor with God's power. Why? Why? Because he intimately knew the greatest man ever, the God-man Jesus. And when you know him that way, it changes everything in your life. This is why Paul was such an effective minister even while he was in prison he knew Jesus Christ 